Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for Cantor's theorem. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to construct functions between sets and power sets and compute subsets from definitions relating to those functions. You should also be able to construct arbitrarily large, in cardinality, uh, sets. Our motivation is that power sets can be used to create larger and larger infinite sets. This is called Cantor's theorem. The standard proof of Cantor's theorem involves a self-reference idea that is used in many deep ways in math and computer science, as we saw last time. Let's start with the finite version of Cantor's theorem. Let A be a finite set, and let P of A be its power set. Then A has fewer elements than uh, P of A. Now, in this context, it's sort of much easier. So for the proof of this one, it's enough to observe that for a finite set, the power set has two to that many elements. So basically here you're counting everything. Now, can you see why we'll run into trouble if A is not finite? Well, the issue here is that we're going to be saying two to the infinity. And this is not quite what, uh, this is not quite formal, saying two to the infinity. So we're gonna have to modify that a little bit for infinite sets. And in fact, our proof for Cantor's theorem for infinite sets will be very different. So how can we prove um, for infinite sets that Cantor's theorem, that, that these cardinalities are different? Well, to prove that this cardinality is less than or equal to this one, you have to show that there can never be a bijection from A to the power set of A, and in particular that there's never a surjection from A to power set of A. So that's what we're going to prove, and before we get to that, let's actually understand some of these functions, because I think the power set of A is already a confusing enough object that when we start looking at functions where that is one of the domain or codomain, I think that can get even more confusing. So let's get our hands dirty with some examples. Let A be the set 1, 2, 3, and here's the power set that we computed uh, previously. I want you to write down any single function you want from A to the power set of A. Write down your favorite one. I also then want you to figure out, can you choose such a function that's an injection? What about, can it be a surjection? And then I want you to compute this set D, and I want you to add, answer this last question. So take a moment to do this now, pause the video and work through these problems. Okay, welcome back. So for this one, I'm going to write down uh, my favorite function and you will have your own. But to follow along, here's my function. F of one is the set one, two. So for every element of A, for every one, two, and three, I need to associate it to one of these eight things. So one got sent to one, two, two got sent to one, three, and three got sent to the empty set. So that's my function. It's a little bit weird because it's domain or numbers and its output is sets, but it's allowed. Can you choose such a function that's an injection? Well, mine is, right? All three of these outputs are different. You could also use the function f of x equals the singleton x. That would be an example of a, an injection that's, that's quote unquote obvious. Can any of your functions be a surjection? Well, in this case, the answer is no. And you might say something like, because a has three things and this has eight things. So there's no way I could do it. But again, we're aiming to say something about infinite sets as well. So we can't use that sort of arithmetic of infinity. But here's what we're going to do formally. Consider the set D, which is the set of all A, such that A is not an element of F of A. This is a confusing thing, but compute it for your function. So let's look at my function. I ask myself, is one an element of its output? Well, one is, so I don't include one in, a, in D. Two here is not in its output, so I include two in this set. And three is also not in its output, so I include both two and three. So for my set, uh, this d is two, three. For your set, it will be a different thing. 
And now I ask, is there any input that outputs this set D? Well, I can look, I only have three outputs, one, two, one, three in the empty set, and none of those are the set two, three. So for my, for my case, the answer is no. But it will turn out for your function two that you picked, the answer is also no. This D will work no matter what function you pick. And that's the key idea behind Cantor's uh, proof. So let's look at the proof of Cantor's theorem. Let A be a set, then the power set of A always has a larger cardinality than the set A. Well, the first thing we need to prove is that there's an injection from one to the other, but this can be done by the function f of x equals the singleton x. You should prove this on your own. Now we're gonna do a proof by contradiction. Let f be a function from a to the power set of a, um, and assume that we have a bijection. So assume that their cardinalities are equal. It turns out that we don't need the full power of bijectivity. It's enough to know that it's a surjection. And just like in the warmup, we'll assume that d is defined in this way, the collection of all a, such that a is not an element of f of a. Now, this is some number of elements of a, so it's a subset of a. By the way, this D should remind you of uh, the paradoxes like Russell's paradox and the barber who doesn't shave themselves. So since D is so since F is a surjection and D is a subset of A, then D is an element of here. So we can find an element of A that outputs this. So since F is a surjection, there is an input that outputs D. So this Y. Now we ask a simple enough question. Is y an element of d? Does y satisfy this condition? So the answer is either yes or no. If the answer is no, it's not in here, then that means that y is an element of f of y. So it doesn't satisfy this property, it satisfies the opposite. But we know that f of y is d. So if the answer is no, y is not in D, then the answer is yes, y is an element of D. Okay, so what if the answer is yes, y is in D? Well, then it satisfies the property, which means that y is not an element of f of y, but f of y is D, so that means that if yes, then no. So this is a contradiction or a paradox. So one corollary of this is you can plug in either the naturals or, so, so if you plug in the naturals, you get that the cardinality of the naturals is less than the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. And then you can take the power set of the naturals itself and plug it into Cantor's theorem. So you get that this set has cardinality less than this. So what we've just done is we've shown that this set has smaller cardinality than this, and this set has smaller cardinality than the next one, and you can keep making bigger and bigger cardinalities. Now, you can also plug in the reals and get larger and larger uh, sets as well. So in words, there are infinitely many sizes of infinity. Now, one thing that we're not going to uh, explore in depth in this course but is uh, important to help you understand is that the cardinality of the reals is equal to the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. So these two sets here are actually equal um, in cardinality. So it's kind of like, here's my smallest cardinality, this is countable, and then everything else here is uncountable. Uncountable, but getting increasingly large. So you can prove this on your own. It's a challenging exercise. Um, you might need help with it. Uh, you can ask, uh, an expert or in office hours or things. Okay, let's take a moment to reflect. Do all uncountable sets have the same cardinality? We know that all countable sets have the same cardinality. Do all uncountable sets have the same cardinality? Is there a largest size of infinity? How is this proof of Cantor's theorem like the Barber paradox we saw in a previous video? Thank you very much and have a great day.